the name I know anymore. Uh, but and, and as you said, I, I sort of, I'm from New Zealand, the land of hobbits and tigers. And for the last eight years, I've been living in London, which is the land of press. <laughs> uh, and I've been working with interactive editors for most of that time. I work at a company called Blonde and Black, which is part of McKinsey. I know the company name sounds kind of sinister, but we're actually a completely legitimate organization. Uh, we have various offices around the world, which is our Boston office. And this is the new one we just opened up in Japan. Uh, and here are some of my friendly co workers. You can see we're a diverse team. And this is my boss, he's a big animal lover. <laughs> anyway, Quantum Black is an advanced analytics company, so we do a lot of fancy things with data. Uh, and I work with a lot of very smart people with data in their job title, uh, like data scientists, and data engineers, and data business designers and developers. And my job is usually to take the data and translate it into a tool or a product that will help them explore it or explain their insights to clients and stakeholders. So I'm going to talk to you today about how to make great charts. But before I get to that, let's begin with a story. I want you to imagine for a minute that you're in Victorian London. It's 1854. The British Empire is fighting Russia in the Crimea. London is the largest city in the world, and it's become a global political, financial, and trading capital. Unfortunately, wealth inequality is out of control, as documented by Charles Dickens, who's so popular has become an international celebrity. Meanwhile, London is suffering from one of its worst ever cholera outbreaks. The disease has ripped through Soho, killing over 600 people, and causing many of the local residents to flee the area. Now, at the time, there were two competing theories on the cause of cholera spread. Some people argued it was spread by rank smelling air, or miasma, uh, that it came out of rotten, decaying matter. And meanwhile, others said that it was spread through some sort of uh, unidentified microscopic uh, organism, or a germ. Now, if you've heard of germ theory, if you haven't heard of miasma theory, then at this point you might have an idea which side was right, but maybe don't spoil it for all of them later, so they have a good idea. Uh, and every good story needs to have a hero, and this story is no exception. He was an English physician and a skeptic of miasma theory, and his name was John Snow. <laughs> oh, not that guy. Uh, that's the one. So John Snow didn't understand exactly how cholera was transmitted, but he knew how to read the evidence, and he didn't like the foul the other theory. He reckoned it was spread through the water supply. By chatting to local residents and studying the pattern of how the disease spread, he identified the source of the outbreak as the public water fountain, what water fountain on Broad Street. Uh, it's just a few uh, minutes walk from our offices, actually, on the surface, which is down in the bottom right hand corner of the map. So John Snow tried to warn everyone about this pump, but they told him, you know nothing, John Snow. <laughs> but he was eventually able to convince the local authorities about his theory with the aid of his, his dog map, which illustrates the cluster of cholera cases juxtaposed with the locations of the water pumps. You can see on the map how the infections are concentrated around the Broad Street pump, which I've marked in blue a little bit. Once he convinced the parish authorities that almost all of the deaths occurred at houses for a shorter period of distance to the Broad Street water pump than to other pumps, they solved the problem by removing the water pump map. This forced people to draw their water from other wells which were not contaminated, and the number of new cholera cases fell. So what does this tell us? Firstly, not to drink water from public taps and so on. If you're in any doubt about this, you should know that not one of the employees at the brewery just up the street from the pump contracted cholera. That's because they were paid in beer, not water. So the doubt, don't drink water, drink beer. This is actually a pub at the location of the former pub called the Job Snow, you can see here. And see they've actually put a uh report a crumb just out of crumb. So you can drink their beer there instead if you're a bit of the pump. Secondly, the well executed chart inspire action. John Snow's use of a map-based database helped convince the city to shut down the infected well. This chart might have saved hundreds of lives. But thirdly, and most importantly, it tells us that a good chart should have a story. Most data visualization is done for the purpose of communication. We have an insight about a data set, and we have a potential audience. And we would like to convey our insight to the audience. 
by cross-referencing your phone's GPS against local weather data. It's amazing for working out whether you need to bring an umbrella when you're about to step out. Uh, before you all downloaded it once, I have to say, unfortunately, it only works in the US, UK, and Ireland. I'm really sorry. Um, anyway, uh, Dark Sky uses an area chart to show when and how much it'll be raining over the next hour. So the developers have included this really cute little wiggle animation, uh, which is great for communicating the level of uncertainty in the data. I think, I think it's really clever. So we have a few different aesthetics that we can use to represent our data. But before you start visualizing it, you need to consider what types of data you're going to represent. You might think of data as numbers, but numerical values are only a couple of the different types of data we might encounter. In addition to continuous and discrete numerical uh, quantitative values, data can come in the form of discrete positive categories, or times, or dates, or as tens. Now, in order to translate your data into a visual aesthetic, you're going to want the scale function. <coughs> Scales are your basic low-level building block of any chart. They make it easy to take different types of data uh, in different formats and convert it consistently into a corresponding aesthetic value, like a pixel distance, a color, or a shape. Importantly, a scale's input and output must always have a deterministic one-to-one -one relationship. So for each different uh, data value, there should always be exactly one aesthetic uh, output value, and vice versa. If a scale isn't one to one, then the visualization can be ambiguous. And to set up a scalable value function, you start by providing an input domain and an output range. The domain is the complete set of data values that the function you can expect to receive, and the range is the set of aesthetic values that you want it to return. So for this the, uh, slide, for example, I'm using a linear color scale uh, to set the Gatron color based on the mouse position, position on the screen. You see as I move it, uh, the color changes. Uh, we have a continuous numerical domain, which is based on the screen height. The input value is set to the current Y position of my mouse as I move it around. It's a new bunch of images here. Um, our output range is the hue of an HSL color, which goes from 0 to 360. And you can see the artistic uh, output on the screen that kind of thing. So now it's time to choose a chart type. There are hundreds of different established formats, and each has different advantages and disadvantages for different situations and types of data. The most important thing, though, is that you choose a chart type because it's the right type for your data. A couple of years ago, I did some work for a client project with a team who asked us to make a bubble chart. We asked why they wanted a bubble chart specifically, and they said it's mainly because the client likes bubble charts. You can show a lot of different dimensions at once with a bubble chart. Uh, they've got, you know, you've got X, Y, and size. It's great, you've got all sorts of things you can show. And uh, it's what they've always used, and the client is going to expect it. So we built it for them. And I think it ended up being a really good bubble chart. Like, with lots of filters and animated transitions for these states and so on. And the client was impressed, and the team were happy, and we liked it. But I can't help thinking that we were going in with one arm tied behind our backs, and that we could have chosen a chart that would communicate it so much better if we'd been allowed more flexibility to choose a chart that would suit the data set. That's what we said when retro did. So above all, if you learn nothing else from this talk, I want you to learn from my mistakes, and don't do what we did in that project. Instead, remember that you should choose a chart based on your data type, the problem you're trying to solve, and the story you're trying to tell, and your audience. Now, this is a really hard problem, but fortunately, there are loads of tools around to help you out. I listed a few here, and I'll read out some links so I've got some links at the end of this chart, um, at the end of these slides. Now, each one of these is slightly different, but they all have a common starting point, which is to ask yourself, what are you trying to show? Are you trying to demonstrate a uh, Correlation between variables or size comparison, or maybe how something changes over time. Find the thing you're trying to present and work from there until you find the right chart for your data story. Okay, so once you've chosen the chart type, now it's time for the fun part building the chart. But you've still got so many options to choose from. Like, which web technology will you build it in? The most common choice is SVG. 
I spend a lot of my time working with SVE, and I often assume that it's a core part of every front-end developer's toolkit. But I meet a lot of other front-end developers who haven't really worked with it much, and don't feel confident running it from scratch. And if this is new, this is totally okay. So here's my very lightning summary of SVG. SVG is basically an alternate universe version of HTML, focused on graphics instead of documents, but where everything is set to position absolutely. You get some new element types like circles, polygons, and lines, but you have a bizarre world version of CSS, which has features like stroke and fill, but you can't use most of the regular useful features that you normally depend on, like background image and border and box shadow and so on. Also, text won't wrap automatically, which is even more annoying than the sounds. Uh, so you have to use JavaScript to calculate the text wrap with where it acts like rendering to the DOM, then measuring the text width, then deleting it and re-rendering it with extra tags inserted to add line breaks, and it's basically a nightmare. Uh, I hate it. But SVG has a DOM, just like HTML, <coughs> so it's not great for JavaScript animations on large numbers of elements. But you can use CSS animations, which is super performant, so I try to use those other JavaScript animations where it's possible. Also, SVG is vector, so it scales well, and you can make it huge uh, without sacrificing image quality. Even if the result is extremely upsetting and you start to wonder why you did it in the first place. <laughs> uh, so, next up, Canvas. Canvas is often used for visualizations that have a large number of animated nodes, like force directs and network charts, or that Snapchat thing I showed you earlier. In practice, writing to Canvas is a lot like using Microsoft Paint with JavaScript. <laughs> Anybody ever here used to, use, used to mess around with creating weird images of Microsoft Paint? A lot of hands, yeah. An old flatmate of mine used to use my computer to, uh, back when we only had one computer in the flat to do these really weird pictures of MS Paint while I was out. And he always set them as my desktop background. Uh, and so I just get home and turn on the computer and just like, what is this? Uh, if you use paint, you'll remember that in paint there are no layers or objects. Uh, if you draw over something, it's gone forever. HTML canvas is the same. Everything is raster, and there's no DOM. It's just a big area that you need to paint onto. The native JavaScript for writing canvas is, uh, tends to be a lot more imperative than writing SVG, which can make it a lot more time consuming uh, to work with. You can't expect any DOM elements or attach mouse events to objects because there aren't any. All of which makes it sound like a mess, which it sometimes is. But it's really performant for complex animations with lots of different elements. If you loaded 8,000 DOM elements and animated them all with JavaScript, you know, your frame rate would drop through the floor. But you can do it with Canvas, and it's usually fine unless you do it on a mobile. Uh, because there aren't persistent objects that you can move around like you would in HTML or SVG, you need to repaint every single frame from scratch. To illustrate this, here's another example I've made. I'm just doing a thing here apparently. Uh, which has loaded a JPEG file and is moving it a little bit around every frame and drawing it again and again. If you let it run, then the canvas will fill up with old copies of the image, which would cause all sorts of problems if you're doing this with HTML or SVG images. But it's canvas, so it doesn't matter. It's just the pixels persisting until you draw over them again. But you do, don't usually want to leave a trail every time you move something on the screen. So usually what you'll do is you'll erase the entire canvas and redraw it again from scratch. Every time you're requesting a new animation frame, which is what I'm doing today. So we've looked at using canvas in a 2D context. It also has a 3D big brother, WebGL. WebGL is basically galaxy brain canvas. Like it is the 2D canvas, or 2D canvas was to everything else, but like even more so. When you think Canvas is performant, WebGL is even more performant. Do you find Canvas tricky to write sometimes? WebGL is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> Consider the following example. So I've shown examples of SVG and Canvas code. So this is a relatively straightforward example of uh, WebGL. Basically a Hello World demo from the intro to WebGL tutorials on the Mozilla Docs website. So let's quickly read over the code and see if we can figure out what it draws. So we're initializing our canvas here, WebGL context, sending out some shades with vertices and fragments, handling line sources, creating some objects, and buffers, and loading textures. Oh no. It's still going. Anybody, any prizes? Anyone guess what that makes? Hello world. Hello world. 
is a spinning cube. Uh, so for that reason, I don't think many people actually write native WebGL code. You're better off using a library like FreeJS, which is what I use to code this lovely spin bar chart. Uh, I use this example to raise a very real issue with 3D charts, which is that most of the time, they're completely gratuitous and don't add anything useful. In fact, by projecting data into a third dimension, then representing it on a 2D screen, and introducing visual distortion. Our eyes can correct the visual ambiguity, but we can only do so much. So much like all those crappy 3D pie charts generated with Microsoft Excel for early 2000s PowerPoint presentations, many WebGL charts are gratuitous decoration that do nothing to help the user understand the data. So I'd avoid them if at all possible. The best exceptions to this rule are visualizations of actual 3D objects, like topographical maps, with mountainous terrain, and things like that. But in this case, you'll still want to allow users to rotate the view so that you can reduce the distortion effect by providing different perspectives. And now, last but not least, let's not forget about HTML and CSS. You can totally make charts using HTML elements. HTML is great for things like simple bar charts. You can make, uh, make use of the normal document flow to arrange them without needing to calculate each bar's bit of offset. I mean, you already know HTML CSS, so there's basically no learning curve, and you can use CSS for animations. Also, HTML makes it easy to write semantic and accessible markup compared to Canvas, which is basically a black box. Now, the downside of HTML is that, although there are loads of shapes and layouts that you can make with CSS, it's ultimately not as flexible as SVG and Canvas. So I recommend the same with things like prototypes and spark charts, and using SVG and Canvas when you have a more complex chart in mind. Right, so we've figured out some technologies we can use, but you probably don't want to build it completely from scratch, right? Other, other people have done this stuff before, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. But this can be a tricky decision too, because there's so many different charting libraries to choose from. There's loads of popular ones out there, like PyCharts, Chartist, ChartJS, and there's a bunch of these D3 with React, like Semiotic, Victory, Reactors, ReCharts, and there's also dozens that are just using re uh, reusable abstractions of D3, like Plotly, C3, R2D3, NVD3, RJD2, D20, C4, R2D2. <laughs> <laughs> there's just way too many. Uh, and these libraries typically provide a few basic chart types and abstract away most of the complexity. Whether this is a help or a hindrance depends on your use case. But some of you might be wondering what D3 is and why is it included in that list. D3 is a data visualization library too, in a way. But unlike the others, it's much more low level. It's a bit more like jQuery or underscore than a true charting library in the sense that rather than giving you ready built charts or chart components that you can configure, it gives you the tools you need to build your own custom charts from scratch and a set of best practices to follow. And in fact, the syntax looks a little bit like uh, jQuery 2. So if you like method chain, you can love it. D3 is, in, is designed to enforce separations of concerns between data and presentation, just like the way it's designed in HTML and CSS. And I know like, that's not a very popular idea lately, both like CSS and JavaScript and all, but I reckon it can still be a useful model at times in the right context. I mean. So instead of asking which library should I use, the real question is, should I use D3 or another charting library? And this one really depends on your situation because each one has a set of pros and cons. For instance, I found that making a chart with a charting library is typically uh, much quicker than writing something from scratch with D3. That's the whole point. They're an abstraction that saves you having to read the whole, repeat the same basic steps every time you make a chart. But when it comes to power and flexibility, that's when D3 can really dance around the competition. It gives you full control over how things look. It has so many different tools, algorithms, that you can mix and match to create, create really cool effects. I've been working with D3 for many years, and I still find that I regularly come across things where I'm like, oh, D3 can do that? It's awesome. Uh, it also works seamlessly with existing web technologies. It can be used in conjunction with other tools and frameworks. You can manipulate any part of the DOM, or use it with SVG, Canvas, WebGL, whatever. By contrast, most charting libraries are fairly opinionated, so they don't always do everything you want them to do. 
Do we have a specific design in mind? And the abstractions that they've chosen may not be your use case. I often find it's not until I've finished building a chart that I discover the limitations of a given library's API and realize that it's not able to do uh, exactly what I want to do. Uh, and I have to start all over again with something else. It's really annoying. I've never had this with D4E, it's just what is to be able to do. Really I want so what I sometimes do is I'll make a basic prototype in a charting library, and I'll check that it's what we, the direction we want to go in. And then once we've got a bit more time and we're, we're comfortable, I'll build a more fleshed out version in D3, once I've got more time on this. But when it comes to the learning curve, there's definitely a downside for D3. Most charting libraries are designed to be fairly easy to get started. Often you just need to modify an example configuration, and it's usually pretty intuitive. Whereas D3 can take a bit longer to get your head around. I found D3's data binding and element creation especially tricky to understand when I was making my first calculator. First, you need to create a new selection and then select all the DOM elements on the page, but they don't exist yet because we haven't created them yet. Then you bind data to them, even though they don't exist yet. And then you enter them, which means selecting the ones that don't exist, uh, that only exist in the data, but not in the DOM. And then you append DOMs to the selection, and only then do they actually get created on the page. Uh, it makes sense when you understand like how it's working, but it just did my head in what I was trying to learn. Now when it comes to performance, whether animation performance or download size, that's a bit of a mixed bag. I found that some charting libraries I've used have been a bit janky at executing complex animations, uh, but it really depends how far you're pushing it beyond what it's designed to do. Whereas D3 is usually great for animation, and it makes it surprisingly easy to do some really cool transition effects, like staggered delays, and you can use CSS animations with it too. In terms of download size, it really depends on the library again. But if you only need one bar chart and you have to include the whole kitchen sink, uh, that's obviously not ideal. Uh, D3 used to be the worst problem with this. Like it has dozens of different APIs, and if you import the whole thing, it's like half a megabyte of unlimited byte code. But as of version 4, it's now completely modular, so you can just import the best you want. Right. Next up, code readability and maintainability. Of course, this depends on the library your preferences are in, and after all that, like, code beauty is in the eye of the beholder a little bit. But I think most of us sort of agree that D3 is more imperative for code style and chain functions are a bit more complex to understand, which means that you need to put more thought into documenting them and avoid writing sprawling spaghetti code. Most libraries are going to be D3 in this one. And finally, D3 is far more popular than any other JavaScript charting library, at least when going by GitHub stars. There's a large community, lots of examples, tutorials, Stack Overflow questions, demos, and even a few books written about it. And I know there was a lot of information for one slide, so here's a quick summary. If you want to just do a standard chart type, like a bar or a line chart, and you're not fussy about the details, coding in D3 will take longer than using a charting library. I, I'd recommend to use D3 in situations where you're trying to implement an unusual design as closely as possible. Now, I mentioned that D3 plays well with other tools, and that includes React and other JavaScript frameworks. But when using them together, you need to make a bit of a big decision about what you're going to use to update the DOM. D3 is still perfectly fine to use for layout calculations, even if you use React for all the DOM rendering. And in fact, out of D3's 30 different modules, 22 of them don't even have any API methods that come in direct contact with DOM. So it's fine if you just want to use React. They're both great for random view, Angular, whatever you want. They're both great with uh, DOM rendering in their own separate ways, and each have their own advantages and disadvantages. Like, D3 is amazing at handling animations, as I said, and some uh, really useful SVG helpers with tricky things like axes. But D3 code tends to make your chart less structured by putting the whole chart in one document, uh, in one component, which can lead to tight coupling between the individual parts. It's a bit less readable than React to power the syntax. It's a pretty tough call. I like the structure and readability that comes with using React components, but I also like the transitions directly on the DOM elements from D3. So why not choose the hybrid approach? What I like to do is combine both approaches to some extent. Like let React render uh, static components, but use D3 for axes and anything that need complex animations. 
You can mix and match the uh, syntax together, see what works for you. For some React plugins that implement D3, just find one of your, with your preferences. But if you want to use D3 for DOM rendering in a React component, you just need to pass a container ref to your D3 code and write it in a component to now and component to update. There's a great article by Elijah Meeks with more details, which I'll add a link to at the end of the slide deck. Finally, you don't just have to use your new D3, SCG, and Canvas knowledge just for making charts. D3 is not just a data visualization library. It's also a data analysis library, a data formatting library, an SCG shape library, an animation library, and a DOM animation animation library. There's dozens of different modules and algorithms to play with. And you can get really creative with them uh, and mix and match different layouts and standard functions to create interesting effects in different contexts. Uh, they're great for adding little playful uh, flourishes to your websites or to your talk slides. Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, do you have some stories from uh, personal experience that uh, like really changed the perspective on the problem? Or, uh, so stories from my own experience, like what changed the perspective on the problem? So I, I'm trying to think of what I've done where we've changed our mind, but what I have found is with some of our charts, I've been really bad at predicting what would be successful, like what other people would like. So I've changed my own perspective in that I've realized that I'm very, very bad at guessing what people will find interesting in charts. Like when I used to make uh, charts that were just, I was effectively making like social link bait, like we just try to make stuff and put it out on social media. And there were a few ones that I was working on where I think, oh, this is this is solid gold, people are gonna love it. And it would just drop like a stone, like no one cared. <laughs> and then the other ones I've worked on where uh, I made this thing, I was doing this uh, chat about like different foods, like takeaway foods that people like around the world. And I was like, nobody cares. This is this is dumb. And people loved it. So I, I have no idea. So I think that's the main thing I've learned is that it's just hard to predict. Although one of the big things I've learned from that is that I'm not sure if it's hundred percent answering your question, so thanks. Uh, is that people always seem to want things to be simpler than I would have expected. If you can break it down to this absolute simplest component, like find a really like tiny thing, rather than just trying to overload people with information and say, here's a whole bunch of data, you figure it out, like there's some interesting things here. Rather than that, just like break it down and show them, like just hit them over the head with the most simple uh, aspect of that data. Because people are ultimately quite lazy and they just want to go down and just be like, I don't have to think like, yeah, wow, that's interesting, I won't be surprised. Anybody else? Um, if you think of anything later, uh, you can hit me up at one of my extremely uh, original and uh, usernames. I'm on Twitter. So, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions.